Hey, Granger family, I just wanted to take a couple minutes um, before we get into today's service just to give you an update as to where we are in the beginning stages of reopening our church. As many of you know, uh, the governor has laid out his plan for the state of Indiana to begin reopening the state and getting things back to normal. And I want to to help you understand probably what the question that's on all of our minds is when will we then begin to gather again as a church at Granger Missionary Church. And what I want to tell you is that we are taking all of the factors into consideration. We are thinking through all of the, the components that go into this. And we will gather as quickly as we can, but we will also do it as safely as we must. And so because of that, we don't have all of the answers for you today, but we, we hope to get more information out to you as quickly as possible because we want to be able to do so in a way that honors our, those who are vulnerable and cares for them in a way that would be as Scripture teaches, to take care of the household of faith. But we also want to do it in a way that allows us to be able to continue the ministries of Granger Missionary Church and continue what God is already doing in and around and through us for the advancement of the gospel. And so in the meantime, I want you to continue watching and, and learning. Find a group, that, a, a virtual small group, or a virtual life group. If you need help getting into one of those, there's a, uh, on our website, you can find it under grangermc.com uh, forward slash connect. You'll find ways where you can uh, join into virtual Bible studies and stay connected even while we're not physically connected. I want us to look for ways to advance the gospel even in our own neighborhoods. Would you pray for your neighbor? Reach out to them again. Would you find ways to partner with your small group or your life group and, and reach out to those in, your, in our community that might be vulnerable or that need help? Pray with those who are on the front lines uh, battling this disease, the doctors, the nurses, the first responders. Pray for them, pray over them. Thank them when you see them. And together, we're going to continue moving forward and, and look forward to the day that we can gather again. And as soon as we have more information, we're going to give it to you and send it to you as quickly as possible so that everybody understands how we will once again gather as Granger Missionary Church. We love you and we can't wait to be with you. Spirit beneath my chain Who can carry that kind of weight He was mighty Till I met you I was breathing but not my failures I try to hide It was my time Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day to call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I've saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old man Jesus when I met you You call my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glory is a to call my name and I ran out of that 
dead, the chains break, I the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now you
what does success look like to you? Maybe it's having a happy family. Maybe it's uh, having financial security. Maybe it's um, having big investments in the bank or, or having that job title or finishing that school. Maybe it's a relationship. For you, that would be success. Um, and not, these things aren't bad in and of themselves, but what I want us to see today, what Scripture is going to teach us today, is that these things in and of themselves are our fickle standard for measuring success. Um, this is why we struggle with things like a midlife crisis. We come to the middle part of our lives and we wonder if we've been successful enough, if our standard of success is the right direction. And so we question things and we try to make it uh, fulfill our lives with either a new direction in life or maybe a new car or something along those lines. But we're going to see today what the Bible has for us and what, how Jesus exposes in our hearts what we believe is the measure of success and begins to replace it with what I believe is and what Scripture teaches is the true measure of success. And this all began, if you remember, back in John chapter 2. Uh, we looked at this last week, verses 23 to 25, where it says, Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And we said that this was going to be an introduction for where Jesus was going to take us over the next series of stories over the next several weeks in which Jesus would expose the human heart in order to give that which will fulfill the heart's longing. And we saw that, we said we'd see that with Nicodemus, and we'll see that next week with the Samaritan woman, and the following week with, with the, the Gentile official. But this week in the middle, uh, Jesus is not encountering one particular person. And so it's many times it's overlooked as this being the introduction for this particular story. But I'd like us to, to see and watch today how Jesus actually exposes people's hearts and how he gives us a way to replace that which he is expo exposed, which that which with that which will truly fulfill us. So, um, I want to take a look, and I want us to remember that this week our key word for the whole message is humility. And when I talk about humility, I'm not talking about the kind of uh, superficial humility that maybe we display, that not the, um, no, no, you have the bigger slice of pizza, you, you take the bigger slice. No, no, that was your parking spot. You go ahead, you go in front of me. Not, honey, you pick the movie. I'm going to be humble and you pick the movie. You know, I remember uh, as I, I, in one place where I worked, uh, there were times when we would share a lunch. We would order something in, or we would have a cake for someone's birthday. And I specifically remember it would be in one spot of our air, common area, and there would always be, it would always shrink in size, and there would always be one piece left. Nobody felt themselves proud enough to take the last piece. Now, it would get whittled down till there was nothing but a little sliver left, but I remember that we would come in the next day and that little sliver would be there because nobody wanted to, to display a lack of humility and be the last person to take the last piece. Until, of course, I realized and justified in my own mind that that was a waste of food. And so to do my better part for the justice of the world, I would take the last piece. And so that was my role in that sp space. But we're not talking about that kind of a humility. We're talking about a radical redefinition at our very core. That's, that's big stuff. So if you have your Bibles, grab them, turn to John chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22. It says this, after this, meaning after Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because the water was plentiful there, and the people were coming and being baptized. It says here, for John had not yet been put in prison. Interestingly, John's gospel is the only gospel for us to mention that Jesus was involved in actually baptizing people. Now, later in John's gospel, in John chapter 4, it, it tells us that Jesus himself did not baptize, but he was involved in the process. For some reason, he, he had his disciples baptizing, and I wonder if it's partly because uh, uh, later, as, as Paul kind of points out, there was a discrepancy or there was an, an argument within the church saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. Well, can you imagine people coming up and saying, oh, you were baptized by Peter? I was baptized by Jesus. I have the t-shirt to prove it. 
it. I mean, th- if anything was a source of pride and the antithesis of what this story is about, that would be it. So we're told later that Jesus actually didn't baptize the people, his disciples did. But this is the only gospel, John's gospel, to tell us this story. And I think it's interesting because what it's showing us is uh, that, that Jesus had a ministry that overlapped John the Baptist's. Uh, All the other Gospels have Jesus beginning his ministry after his own baptism and after John has been sent to prison. But here we're told that Jesus and John's ministry overlap, and that's going to set the stage for the the need for humility that we'll see in just a little bit. Now, the baptism that's happening here is not, as we understand it, Christian baptism, the baptism that signifies Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and and it's our first step in walking in obedience to Christ. That wasn't this baptism. Remember, Christ didn't die yet. This baptism was the Jewish rite of baptism, which signified uh, purification based on repentance. John and uh, Jesus up to this point was were preaching a, a, a call to repentance for God's coming judgment through the Messiah. Uh, obviously, Jesus is the Messiah, but this was the, the repentance that they were calling towards, and people would come from all over uh, claiming repentance and, and being cleansed with the purification of the water to signify their repentance. And so this is the baptism that's happening here. And what I want us to see is that whether you consider yourself successful or not, this this passage, this section teaches us that all of redemption begins with repentance. I mean, that's what the people were doing here. Uh, Jesus, the call of Jesus is, is one that begins with a call to repentance. Coming to Jesus means that you turn. In the Hebrew, uh, the idea of repentance, the word for repentance, literally was shuv, which meant to turn. It literally meant to turn and walk away from the life that you once knew and toward a life with Christ, leaving behind all of your your failures and all of your successes. You see, everyone needs redemption, and we need to remember that. Success, the successful and the failures were all coming to Jesus and coming to John to be baptized. When they recognized their need, they came to be baptized. The successful, they needed to recognize that they had a need. The failures knew they had a need and needed someone to redeem them. We all need to be redeemed, and it all begins with repentance. And repentance in essence, is literally a dying, a dying to ourselves and giving ourselves over to Christ. And so I encourage you, as we walk through this, ask yourself, maybe you're, maybe you're one today that you consider yourself pretty successful in life. And maybe as, as Jesus opens this scripture up to us in our hearts, maybe, maybe you'll begin to recognize your own need for redemption. We all need to be redeemed. Or maybe you're, you're, you're starting out here and you're already recognizing you're in that failure category. category. You need to be uh, redeemed. You need someone to, to pick you up. Um, the good news is this, this story is for everybody because we all need redemption. It says here in verse 25 then that now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And so they came to John and said to him, Rabbi... He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. I just, I love this. We don't know what this this dispute was over. We don't know what the argument was over. We're just told it was over purification. It, It really doesn't even appear in the rest of this passage. But what's interesting is that this Jew was was possibly one of Jesus's uh, uh, crew was uh, baptized E, and he was coming over to John's crew, and they were having a discussion, and, and somehow John's followers recognized the amount of people that were in Jesus' side of the river, and he was baptizing, and so they come to John to make sure he knows this. Uh, John's disciples come over, and, and not over the purification issue, they're actually more concerned that John is losing followers. And every Instagrammer knows there's nothing worse than losing followers. That's the problem, right? They, they say, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. Now, that's a really big problem when your last name is the baptizer, the Baptist. And that John was John the Baptist. So he was losing pieces of his very identity in the fact that these people were going over and being baptized by Jesus. Uh, it actually says in John's gospel a little bit later that, that the, the, the Pharisees recognized that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. 
I mean, with, an, with your last name, the Baptist, this is a really big problem because this hits you right in your identity. And so, according to John's disciples, Jesus is a threat to John's success. And so, how does John respond to this? What's John's response to the fact that he's losing followers to Jesus? Well, verse 27 says this, John answered and said, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. See, For John, the discussion goes in a totally different direction. He's not focused in on the best method to win back these followers, the best method to win new followers, the the, the, the sending a spy to figure out the way uh, way that Jesus' disciples baptize versus the way that his disciples baptize. His concern more is on the actual definition and the measure and the source of success rather than becoming in the world's eyes, successful himself. Now, that's, that's huge. That's key. That's the point of humility we, we're looking for. See, John does, instead of trying to figure out how to gain more, he does what he's been doing all along. He points people to Jesus. That's, John says, that's why I'm here. And, and we're told uh, over and over, John's reminded that John in, John, in chapter 1, it says that there was a man sent from God, speaking of John the Baptist, that says that he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. John 1 verse 20 says, uh, John the Baptist says, I am not the Christ. John chapter 1 verse 27, he says, he's not even worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. John has never been shy about proclaiming who Jesus is in, in relationship to him. And so the gospel writer here, I think in this passage, in our passage today, is not simply retelling what we've already been told earlier in John's gospel, in in comparing uh, John the Baptist uh, and showing us that John the Baptist is not Jesus, and comparing John the Baptist and Jesus. What he's trying to show us here is John the Baptist's response to Jesus. And that response is one of humility, because here's what John essentially says, that the increase of Jesus is the measure of our success. The increase of Jesus is the measure of our success. You see, John recognized the source of true success. In verse 27, he says, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. See, John the Baptist recognizes that he's not a self-made man. He's a God-made man. He didn't come up with his own success. He didn't lay on himself the calling to point people to Jesus. That was God that did that. And if God was the source of his calling, God was the source of his success. God was going to use him or not use him as God chose. James 1 tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from heaven, from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow or change. And so we know that every good gift comes from God. And John recognized that. He recognized he was not the source of his success. Because here's the thing, when you believe that you are the source of your success, you will find yourself either feeling too strong or too weak. You will either be too proud thinking you control your own destiny, or you will feel too weak, be under the weight of needing to compete with others for your success. But John had the right view. He recognized the source didn't lay with him, it lay with God. You see, the anxiety of creating or maintaining success is then released when you recognize the source. And then you can focus then on the definition of success. So John understood the source of success, and then he had a change to the definition of success. Verse 29 Uh, It says this, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Now, John's referring to Jesus as being the bridegroom, and the bride, obviously, as we see throughout Scripture, is the church, the people of God. And so, John says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, the best man, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete." You know, we said earlier at the very beginning that we were going to be talking about the redefinition of success that goes to the very core of who we are. 
And the reason we're going to do that is because that which you define as success both motivates and guides your daily decision-making, and it will ultimately be your source of joy. Notice in here how John says that when he sees Jesus uh, come for his bride, he's filled with joy. Even if that means the expense of John's ministry and his followers, he rejoices that Jesus is winning. And so you see that which you define as success will motivate and drive you and, 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 and lead you in your daily decisions to pursue that area of success and will ultimately become your source of joy. And for you, I don't know what that might be. Maybe that's a job title. Maybe that's what gets you up in the morning to drive you to, to finally be the CEO, the CFO, the COO, the C fill in the blank O. Maybe it's to have a certain amount of money by a certain amount of time so that you can have a certain amount of lifestyle. Maybe that's what motivates your every decision-making and how you spend and how you move. Maybe it's a certain relationship, being a mom, being a dad, being a mom of, being a dad of, whatever it might be, you need to decide and you need to ask the Lord to show you what what is it that's driving you and motivating you? What is your definition of success? Because the problem is, if you don't achieve that or if you feel you aren't achieving that or if by some way that's taken from you, then what happens is you're left with pain, you're left with depression, you're left with feelings of failure, and that you're less than, because your success was tied to who you think you are. And if you do achieve, there's a danger on that end too, because then it may lead you down a path of false sense of security, of placing your identity, placing your joy in something that was never actually meant to bear under that weight. Jesus tells a story about this in Luke chapter 12. In Luke 12, a man comes up to Jesus complaining about his brother, right? And he asks Jesus, can you tell my brother to just share with me? Can you tell him to share the inheritance he has? And in Luke 12, it says, Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of of his possessions, ideally in success and having that wealth of success. Now, this story that he, that Jesus then tells a story of a rich man who's so successful that he needs to build bigger barns in order to haul, hold all of his wealth. I don't know about you, but that's pretty successful. If I have to build a bigger uh, house to hold all of my things, a builder, bigger garage in order to have all my cars, if I have to go find a bigger bank to keep all my money, I would consider that, at least in the world's eyes, as successful. And so that was this man, this rich man, this was his attitude. But it says in Luke chapter 12 that God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, I don't believe that that story that Jesus told was just a story about amassing uh, uh, an an overabundance of possessions or about uh, um, being rich or wealthy specifically, but I think it was actually about finding our security, finding our identity, finding our joy in something that doesn't last. And finding your success, whether it be the source of it or whether you define it as something in this world or something, whether it's a job title, relationship, place, money, in this world, that won't last. And you will find yourself either on the end of prideful arrogance waiting for a fall or under the weight of competition and feeling like a failure. Because John here understood the source of success and changed the definition of success. You know, John the Baptist has a very different definition of success based on his role as the bridegroom's best friend as opposed to the actual bridegroom himself. You see, if you don't recognize the true source of success or you don't redefine the measure of success, hear me, you can still have humility Even if you don't recognize God as the source of success or redefine success in the way that that, that promotes Christ in everything, you can still be humble, but it won't result in joy. It'll result in grudging humility, in, in having to do it rather than getting to do it. See, the definition of success is faithfulness in seeing Jesus in your life and others seeing Jesus through your life. 
Now, let me say that again because this, this is key. The definition of success, as John is teaching us, as Jesus tells us, as the scriptures tell us, is to see Jesus more and more in your life and to have others see Jesus through your life. Now, the good news is, this levels the playing field. You see, the wealthy businessman may be just, may be actually unsuccessful in, as according to this definition, whereas the high school dropout may be completely successful based on this definition. And it might be vice versa. It has nothing to do with the things that we see, the wealth that is amassed, the titles that are given, or the relationships that we have. It all has to do with our faithfulness to seeing Christ increased in our life and increased in the world around us. And so that leads us to a redefined measure of success. If we have a new understanding of the source of success, we've redefined what success is, now we can redefine the actual measure of it. You see, the measure of success for John was that Jesus' fame and his glory was increased. That's how he knew it was working. And even if it was at the expense of his own glory and fame and ministry. And so here's where the questions start to get really hard. My question for you is, are you okay with becoming unknown, unpopular, unproductive, even forgotten or called a failure if it means that you know Jesus more and that Jesus is known more through you? Are you willing to actually become unpopular, unknown, forgotten if it means that Jesus just might be known more in you and in the world around you? Are you willing to take a demotion if it means that you have an opportunity to share Jesus with people that might not otherwise hear? Would you be willing to move, if the Lord should call you, into a place of complete obscurity, where no one might know your name, but lives might be saved and come into the kingdom of God? Are you willing to go that far for, for Jesus? Are you really willing for Christ to be increased, even if it means your decrease? If no, then you need to go back and revisit your source of success, your definition of success so that you can have a greater understanding of the measure of success. You know, uh, in Ole, Pennsylvania, where my wife and I and our family are from, there's a road sign in the middle of a, along a cornfield here, with, and off into the field there's this tiny little building. And on this road sign, one of those historical signs, it talks about the Moravians who landed there, or not landed there, but came to the Oli area and settled there in uh, the mid-18th century. And uh, one of those buildings there was used as a one-room schoolhouse by the Moravians. And the Moravians actually came to America as they were uh, started and led by a man by the name of Zinzendorf, Nicholas von Zinzendorf. And Nicholas von Zinzendorf was a product of the Reformation, and he began to call the church back together. And a couple of the notable factors and, and features of the p- group of people that he brought together, known as the Moravians, was a, a sense of community among the people and a sense of mission by the people. He would send out people, no matter who they were, whether they were wealthy businessmen or whether they were the local plumber, and he would send them out on the mission of God uh, to be missionaries long before uh, any other national or major missionary was sent anywhere in the world, before William Carey went to India, about 60 years before William Carey went to China. Um, the Moravians were out doing missions. And Zinzendorf, in order to help them understand their role as a missionary, said this, Remember, you must never use your position to lord it over the heathen. Instead, you must humble yourself and earn their respect through your own quiet faith and power of the Holy Spirit. He said, the missionary must seek nothing for himself, no seat of honor or hope of fame. Like the cab horse in London, each of you must wear blinkers that blind you to every danger and to every snare and conceit. He said this, listen, you must be content to suffer, to die, and to be forgotten. All for the name of Christ. Another quote is attributed to him, and it's one that I I take to heart, where he says, preach, die, and be forgotten. That's the role of the preacher. It really is. Because you are increasingly successful as Jesus is increasingly seen in your life. 
Notice there's no number given here. There's no bring 50 people to Christ and then you're successful. There's no title, attend the rank of of super Christian and then you're successful in Jesus' eyes. There's no doing. You do this, you give this, you look like this, don't do this, do this, you become successful. It has nothing to do with any of those areas. It's an attitude of humility focused on the increased fame and glory of Jesus through your life. That is success. Because as we see here that Jesus is both the standard and the goal of success. Verse 31 says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. This kind of thinking, uh, by the way, doesn't make any sense because Jesus, to this world because Jesus is actually the standard and Jesus is not of this world. He is above all. He is, he's not just a standard that we see around us. He is above all the standards in this world, and he is the standard for our success and the measure of it. It says, verse 32, he bears witness to what has been seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent, sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is above all and, and distinguished above all. Jesus is, sets the standard for everything that we have. You see, we don't measure our success by culture's success. We me- uh, understanding of success. We measure our success by the kingdom's understanding of success. You see, it's a kingdom down to the culture approach, not our culture being shoved up to what we think God should have as the measure of our success. And the problem is, this is not a a health and wealth gospel story. This is not a a, a gospel story that that claims that we'll have our best life now or we'll have all the blessing right now. This is not even um, on the other end of the scale, a doom and gloom story. This story right here, and I love this, is a story of redemption and grace. You see, health and wealth gospel is cheap and fleeting. The doom and gloom gospel is a false picture of who God is. But redemption and grace is Jesus. Bring to him what you have. Repent. See him as the source. Let him redefine success for you. And in that, you will find joy as Jesus increased in your life and increased in the world around us. See, when the scale of success is recalibrated to the weight of glory given to Jesus in your life, it means that there is success even in the things the world calls mediocre or what the world calls ordinary or what the world calls extraordinary or what the world calls failures. When the scale of success is recalibrated to the weight of Jesus' glory, those things are recalibrated as well. See, this means that you are not a failure. You're not. The only way to fail in this kind of a life is to not allow Jesus to have your life, to redeem it, to make something of it. To understand uh, and receive with joy uh, requires a redefinition of understanding success and the new measure of success according to Jesus. See, now is the time, the ideal time for us to reevaluate our definition and our measure of success. Now, while the world is on pause, without the distractions and the busyness of of work life, of of those things around us, of, of commercial business, of things drawing your heart in different directions, telling you this will make you successful, this is what you need to complete your life, now is the time to reevaluate this. Don't waste This time, this time when Jesus is exposing our hearts and magnifying what we've been too busy to really look at, now is the time for this. And so with the world on pause, let me ask you the question, what is your pursuit? What is your definition of success? What has it been? Now that it's quiet, what has been your definition of success? What has gotten you up and motivated you every day of the week? How has that caused anxiety, stress, or even pride in your life? What are the areas of your life, then, in response to this that that really must decrease? As we begin to think about returning back to normal, what are the areas that need to be decreased so that Jesus can increase in your life? What do you need to repent of? Remember, redemption begins with repentance. What do you need to repent of in order to redefine success in your life? The beauty is, the beauty is you can't lose 
in this process. You can't lose in this process. If the definition of success is looking more like Jesus and pointing others towards Jesus, then the only qualification you need is simply to know Jesus. That's the only qualification you need in order to be successful. If successful is faithfulness to Jesus, all you need is to know Jesus. And that happens with an initial moment of repentance, recognizing there is nothing that you can do on your own to be made in a right relationship with Christ, calling out to Jesus to save you. Taking that next step of obedience with him in the waters of baptism is a way to show the world that you have repented and to show that you're going to walk in a newness of life and with a redefined understanding of success that Jesus might increase more in your life even at the expense of the world's definition of success. This means you can be the worst plumber in the world and still be a success. You can, you can have gone through bankruptcy, or you might be very wealthy, and you can still be a success. You can have gone through a divorce, or you could have a picture-perfect family, and you can still be a success in God's eyes. This is why the story begins with baptism, because it's a picture of repentance. Repentance. You know, if I can get personal for a moment, this story has been hard for me. You know, ministers have to wrestle with these same ideas as well. We have many people telling us in our ears what success looks like as leaders of the church. And I'll just be honest, it's late in the week for me to be preaching this because it's taken some time for me to apply these scriptures to my own heart. What is the world going to look like when we begin to come back to church? Who's going to be back at church? How many people will be back at our church or will have left and gone to another church? What about the church down the street? Are they going to gain some of my followers? I'll I'll be honest. I've had to do some repenting this past week. I've had to redefine success as a pastor. I've had to think through and apply how these scriptures hit my life. And And I want to commit to you to lead you in a way that Christ has increased, even if we no longer remember who Jason is. I want you to remember Jesus, even if you forget Jason. And I, I ask you to pray for me as your pastor that I might have an increased desire and joy in seeing Jesus glorified in our world, in our churches of our neighborhood, in the places down the street, and and across the the world, even at the expense of my own ministry, that Jesus might increase even as I decrease. You know, John Wesley uh, had a covenant prayer, and I'd like to just end with this. It's a prayer that reminds us and kind of reorients us back to the right measure of success. It says this, I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt, put me to doing or put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily Yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed Father, God and Son and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. And amen. And I To soften in my heart and break me apart, I need you to open my eyes to see.
spray. 